Uh, my name is Wei Liang. I'm from the physics department in uh, NTU, doing my PhD now. Uh, yeah, so due to the interdisciplinary nature of complexity, uh, we always have a right range of speakers from different fields in uh, this conference. So uh, for example, this morning we got Professor Geoffrey West, who is a theoretical physicist. And then uh, earlier we had a social scientist from uh, Nanyang Business School. So to cover all disciplines, I guess now we have uh, Tony Bjordam, who is an artist based in Norway. Uh, Tony got her MFA from uh, the Art Academy in Norway, and her works are based on multiple uh, medium, uh, such as nature photography, filmography, uh, abstract painting, and sculpting. So if you Google her name, you will see this like 32 minutes video, uh, which, in which she collaborated with a scientist slash musician called uh, Martin Schaefer. And uh, in this video, they portrayed the beauty of uh, transitions in an animated film format. Um, I guess the title of this artwork is the best bridge to this conference. Uh, this, the title of this artwork is called Critical Transitions. So as someone from a science background, this talk is particularly interesting for me because uh, sometimes as scientists, scientists uh, dive too quickly into the mathematical rigor and the uh, uh, details of a problem and we fail to see actually the bigger picture, the aesthetics of the, 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 the problem as a whole. So uh, with this talk, Tony promised to uh, show us the beauty, something that we probably have missed along the way. And uh, hopefully from today onwards, we'll all get a better perspective when we are doing our uh, own research. Yeah, Tony, please. My name is Tune Bjorda. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I come from Norway and I am a visual artist. I make uh, projects related to nature, perception and ecology. I work with uh, different techniques, like already mentioned video, animation films, photography, painting, drawings and sculpture. I have a master's degree in fine art from the Art uh, Academy in Oslo, Norway, and I exhibit artwork internationally. Inspired by science and our experience of forms in nature, I have for many years been working with video projects visualizing the movement and progression of liquid color in fluids and unfolding organic forms in motion. I stage controlled yet playful experiments and create imaginary landscapes and paintings in motion. First, I am going to take you through some of my artwork and a couple of things that has motivated me into being an artist in the first place. I will also talk about our perception of time and change and share some thoughts. Can you maybe turn this off? Yeah, I will also share, um, talk about our, our perception of time and change and share some thoughts um, around changes in nature and in society. All of this accompanied with uh, some stories and uh, my own artwork. This image is from 2004 and the title is Nomad. A friend of mine once said that my studio looks like a strange kind of laboratory filled up with bottles and tubes of colors, big water containers, feathers, rocks, crystals, sculpture and uh, film equipment. I guess my studio is still a, a little bit like that, only it is a bit bigger. I'm interested in studying forms in nature from an artistic point of view by working in a free and intuitive way. Moving and stretching my motives visually towards something abstract, like in these paintings I made of jellyfish.
Other times I work in a naturalistic way, like in this painting of a seagull in flight. I look for different moods and atmospheres in nature. In the morning, in the nighttime, in a snowstorm, in a sunny, moist forest, or underwater. I took this image in the forest where I live in Norway just a few days ago. When you see an ice crystal, it gives a special feeling when you know that these crystals cover not only the ground in front of you, but also the trees and the surroundings for maybe hundreds of kilometers around you. I like to see things from different perspectives, to look at nature in different light, different angles, or upside down, like in this photograph I took in 2007. This photograph I entitled Stone Face. I took it in Breheimen, the home of the glaciers up in the mountains in Norway. We used to live there all summer some years ago. It is very refreshing for the senses to live in a place like that over time. You get used to nuances of blue, grey, white, green and brown. And when I came down to the green valleys in the autumn, the colour green was so refreshing and the colour red was so extremely vivid. And coming to the city after a summer in the mountains, I noticed that instead of looking at the architecture, like I normally was, I was looking for signs of nature. Was that canal once a river? Is that hill natural in the landscape? This image is also uh, from uh, Breheimen, from the mountains, by the way. This is an ink drawing I made back in 1999, entitled Into the Woods. And I have a question. Can you change someone's opinion? Well, at least you can give people another point of view. And then they might change their own opinion. And I will tell you a small story about that. When I was 17, I met a guy just by chance at a cafe. He told me he was studying to become a plumber, and he was asking me what I was studying. I told him uh, that I was studying arts and design at the School for Communication Art. This was for, before I went to the Art Academy. He said, but what are you really going to do? I understand it's fun and all, but you're going to need a real job eventually, you know. I was a bit provoked by that, so I told him this. Imagine a world without art. Where you live in a grey concrete room, in a grey square building, there are no paintings on the walls, no photographs, no patterns on the cups. There is nature. But no human-made art, no music on the radio, no concerts, no dance performances, no theater, no films, no poetry, no literature, no public art, no art museums, and no art history. It was an overwhelming experience, not only to him, but also to me, because it was like watching him wake up. He said, look at that beautiful thing hanging in the ceiling over there. And Look at that painting. Have you ever seen something so amazing and beautiful? <laughs> it made me think that it is possible to change someone's mind about something if you give them another point of view. In uh, 2000, I made an animation film called Metro Grey about a guy that lives in a grey city without art. He sees colors in his dreams, when he thinks about his childhood, and when he lets his imagination wander. A small bird representing nature sometimes nests in a scarf around his neck. It whistles in his ear from time to time. You're you, you're you, you're you. To remind him, him of, of who he is. I applied to the Art Academy with this film. I also applied with this film about a group of scientists trying to save coral reefs. I got in, and it was in 2001. Now, artists, they often kind of um, present things in a little bit personal way. A scientist would normally not do that. But for artists, that's what we work with, in a way. <laughs> so this is a small story. I grew up on a farm called Bjordam in southeast Norway. Long before I was born, 
1927, my grandfather found a hill at the farm full of rare sunstone. My grandparents had a small museum in their living room filled with beautiful rocks, minerals, and colorful crystals. I remember early on trying to imagine how the sunstone had been created in the first place, the visual drama of it. I imagined rapid movements of lava, explosions, tiny colorful mirrors of hematite that was flying into the orange feldspar, the white quartz, the black mica. And then it stopped in a frozen state for millions of years, until we took it out of the ground, looked at it, and gave it a name. Later on, this made me think further about how things change in nature and about our perception when it comes to change and how we experience time and space. While I was studying at the Art Academy, I started to try to capture some of that. In the In 2005, I made this video entitled Liquid Landscape. It looks a bit like a landscape, a horizon and an island slowly emerging. It is a rather dark and gloomy tale, mostly told in black and white with hints of color in between. I also made another video, Senate, in 2006, inspired by meteorology. Uh, the Northern Lights, Clouds, and uh, Weather Systems. I don't know why it doesn't start. Oh, it's gone. Okay, yeah, there's just a video that doesn't play. There it is. In 2009, I made Coral. It is a different, it is very different from the dark liquid landscape. Coral is very bright and colorful. Beautiful forms are emerging from the water surface. It looks like plants, clouds, or maybe corals, like the title suggests. That is the pow power of abstraction. You can read it in different ways every time you see it and put your own stories into the tale. Coral has been shown many places and was a part of an exhibition called Carnegie Art Award in 2010, touring Denmark, Finland, Norway, Iceland, and Sweden. Um, so... In Sweden, there was a resilience conference, and they had their conference dinner at an art museum. And that was when a scientist called Martin Schaeffer and also scientist Carl Folke saw my work. Martin is studying how systems change and how we can predict changes in, in systems. And he is uh, famous for a theory called critical transitions. When Martin saw Coral, my video at the art exhibition, he saw that we maybe had something in common, that we both try to communicate changes in nature, although we do it in very different ways. He does it in a scientific way. He is a, a biologist and ecologist, and he studies nature and other systems like society, economy, the body, and the human mind. And then he writes articles and books about it. I do it in a, an artistic, free and visual and very intuitive way. One year later, he wrote an email asking if we could perhaps do something together. And first I, I thought, who is this guy? And then we talked on the phone, we met and we started to work together. In 2012, we made an art video called Critical Transitions. I made all the visual art inspired by Sin Martin Science and Martin composed and played all the music. He's also a, a very good musician, uh, as well as a brilliant uh, scientist. Um, so he, he played all the music together with Arthur Bont on percussion. 
uh, it was also what you heard in the very beginning of my talk. Um, it looks like an abstract painting in motion. The video has three sequences. Each sequence starts in a stable system and then goes into a turbulent and dramatic stage with warning signals that a tipping point for the system is about to happen. Um, the imagery becomes rather chaotic before it goes back into a new stable state. The aim of this video is not to explain all the aspects of a critical transition. It is an artistic approach. I was thinking about showing it, but I think that uh, I can show the whole thing while the discussion is going on later. Because it's, uh, it's quite long. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll do that. Okay? You'll see it just, just later. What Martin and I found out while making... I can just show you very, like, I can, I can jump a little bit just to uh, give you an idea. So this is the first part. Um. Oh, why not just show it, right? You want to see a little bit of it at least?
So, what Martin and I found out while making this video uh, was that our perception of time when it comes to dramatic events of a system in change, in the middle of a drama we tend to get caught up in all the little details and the visual appealing aspects of chaos. But when a change is about to happen, it is important to stand back and try to see the whole picture, to try to trigger a positive change or to avoid a disaster. If a forest would change into a desert in seconds, or the other way around, if, a, if rain in a desert would change it into a huge flourishing forest in seconds, we might see the drama of that event differently. When it comes to climate change, we really need to take a step back and look at the big picture, because it will affect so many aspects of life on this planet. In fact, it already does. It is urgent to find the best solutions because this drama has the power to change everything in our society, in our economy and in all the systems that we have created. It will even change nature itself. So this te technique I'm working with, it's a sort of a little bit like a painting in motion, right? Where you can see the different layers of the painting in a way. Um, I have believed in human-caused climate change for a long time, but it was when I first heard about the Keeling curve that I totally stopped questioning if the climate change we see happening globally now is caused by humans. I'm not an, at all an expert in this uh, topic of the Keeling curve, but um, when I saw the proof of the air bubbles that are trapped in the ice, 
in the Arctic and the, in Antarctica, Antarctica, containing CO2 and methane captured in the ice as far back as 800,000 years, when you can read the history of the climate on this planet through time, through the tropical phases with 300 ppm CO2 and the ice ages with the 200 ppm CO2, it shows that we could have had maybe, oh, sorry about that. My arrow is wild, going wild, there it is. It shows that we could have had maybe 4,000 years more of stable climate on this planet. 4,000 years. That's a long time. When you see the graph suddenly leaving its natural path and going almost straight up, starting from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, getting more and more steep after 1850, approaching our time, and after 1950, the graph raises to levels way beyond what has been recorded in the time span of 800,000 years. In fact, I, this is what I've been reading about, but uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe you know better. Um, but the, the amount of CO2 has reached 400 ppm and is higher now than it has been for 15 million years. I don't know, that's probably something you can argue about. We can argue about it, I don't know. Then it is clear that this is caused by human behavior because it, something has happened. But that also gives hope. If it was a natural event, a natural change in the climate, we could not do so much about it. When it is proven to be caused by us humans, it means that we can actually do something about it. I'm sure many of you in the audience are aware of this. But all the time I get surprised when I talk with people outside scientific or envir environmentally aware circles, that people don't have a clue about this, although it is a proven fact that everyone should know about. Surely things like uh, COP21 in Paris gives us hope and a fresh start, but it is our common path and the choices we all make now um, that will decide the future of so many kinds of living things on this planet including us. So, more about art. This is a series I made with photographs of a river. It starts naturalistic, in a naturalistic way, with the, and with a longer aperture time, the image moves more and more towards something abstract, and it looks more like a painting after a while. Our human perception is such a huge inspiration. How we experience life with our different senses. One of the most inspiring seminars we had at the Art Academy was something we called Perception Seminar. We invited people from a wide spectrum of fields in science and art, but also people with other jobs, like for example, firemen. They live a normal life and then they uh, go into extreme danger and extreme heat. They came to our auditorium and said that we don't really know why we're here, but we have been asked to talk about our job. We had an uh, optom <laughs> optometrist, I can't really, okay, a scientist uh, uh, that was studying eyes and, and, and uh, another one, um, a neurologist, talking about how our se uh, senses are wired to the brain and an astronomer talking about the universe. After her talk, there was a discussion, and I remember her saying to the audience after the discussion, I did not know why I was invited here, but thank you so very much, because so many interested things came up. And now I have new ideas about what to study further for the next 50 years. To work across different disciplines can be something extraordinary, when you meet people that have deep knowledge about an interesting topic. Um, an artwork can change according to the place it is shown. Here coral is shown like a moving painting on a wall in a museum in Denmark. A public installation on a ship. Art pops up everywhere and it's 
it's a wonderful way to reach out to people about your, your thoughts. At an art exhibition at uh, in, uh, Kunstnernes Hus in Oslo, projected on the wall in an old factory. Here we see critical transitions as a public installation at the central station in Oslo, where it was shown for two months in the summer of 2013. And in that way you can also reach out to people that would not normally maybe go to an art exhibition or, yeah. or on the sail of a ship in Sweden. The, that was a video actually that was projected on the sail, by the way. The importance of playfulness and the pro process of working. I think it is important to be playful. I took this picture of a pelican diving for fish just as it breaks the water surface. I think it is an interesting contrast between the beach life and the people in the background and the graceful pelican doing its daily routine. That's my family in the background, by the way. <laughs> I love to study forms in nature and then to take those experiences into my studio and make something about make something out of that. I can use days and sometimes weeks on a drawing like this one. Sometimes I continue to work on it, uh, sometimes for years, and uh, I come back to it from time to time. Other times I, it takes just a minute to make an artwork, like this sheet of ice I found in a lake and photographed in front of a rock. I was in Lofoten in the north of Norway some years ago, and then in the morning, I had a glass of milk, sour milk, and I started to take 200 photographs of that, uh, that glass of milk, and that might seem very odd for people when, when you see someone like so interested in, in, in something as ordinary as that, that, in a way. But the thing is that um, it reminded me of the patterns of snowy trees or a glacier, and the urge to understand this pattern might seem strange, but it might help me when I want to take images of a real glacier, or it might add to a work like this, or when I make a painting like this one. I made this painting last autumn, and I placed it outside when I took this picture, so the surrounding is, is nature, and it can also hang in a room, and then if there is a, a city, for example, on the other side of, of the painting, that is what you are going to see through it. Uh, so the upper part is transparent. Uh, the title is Melting Mountain, and on the other side there is another painting, like this. It works like a two-frame story, where you can see the other side of the mountain on the other side of the painting. Although I painted it in a rough way, partly almost abstract, it is representing a melting glacier melted into a waterfall, and even the rocky surface around it seems to melt. So that's Melting Mountain. It was recently exhibited on an art festival in Helsinki in Finland called Art Artica, about the Arctic regions. The festival used a quote by filmmaker Louis Schwarzenberg. He said, we protect what we fall in love with. I thought that was a very beautiful quote. In video, I often try to stretch the borders between video and, paint, between video and painting. And I like to stretch the rules of paintings also. This painting, Ice Cap from 2001, also have transparent parts so that you can look through and see the other side of the painting. So it hangs from strings uh, from, from the ceiling, and you can look at it from both sides. And with light, the light changing, the paint also changes, sometimes dramatically. And it, so I try to make these paintings, and they change through the day. Um, so, and the painting sometimes change color, intensity, or expression according to how the light shines through them. This is another one, a bit like a forest floor, and then when the light shines through it, it's like this. And it has these kind of micro-macro 
qualities to it. It can look like a river or moss or, yeah. This is another painting and this is the first side. And the second side of the painting is inspired by a sort of algae you can sometimes see on the snow and ice and that from time to time make icebergs pink and the title is polar pink and with the light shining through that it looks a bit like that yet another one like it is and then with the light shining through it okay so this is a drawing I made for a scientific article called Dual Thinking. It has been published in Ecology, Ecology and Society and in a Swedish neuroscience magazine called Holon. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the process of working before I talk about the drawing. Um, because when I was in the Art Academy, um, I found a, a little private theory of my own about my way of working because first I found it very frustrating because this is how I am. I get an idea and then in theory I could just do that idea straight away. But I'm not like that. I, I need to take, uh, I make uh, some different versions of it and sketches, and then I read about the topics that I'm interested in, and then I might um, write about the work, and then I make some more sketches, and then uh, maybe uh, try to make the work, but then I have to try to make more sketches because it didn't work out, and then I write some more, and then I read some more and look at photographs uh, that can be inspiring. And then I get back to that my, main, uh, the main idea. Uh, and at first, for, before the Art Academy, I went to a more like an art and design school. And it was, they wanted me to do a project for maybe a couple of days and then it was finished. Well, I often wanted to work with a project for months. <laughs> when I got the idea, I wanted to really go into it. Uh, and um, I thought it was really, really frustrating. But at the Art Academy, I found out that this is a very good quality when, when you're an artist, because I try to stay true to the idea so that you can understand the, the, the artwork easily when you see it. Uh, but at the same time, all of this really adds to the layers of the work. And I like artwork uh, to, be, to have many layers that you can go into the different layers and, and, and get a richer experience. So, and also working with the scientists adds a lot to that because... Um, Working with, with Martin Schaeffer and Karl Folke, for example, they are so rooted in the knowledge that they already have, and then I'm rooted in my artwork. And when we put it together, it can be very strong. So sometimes I think scientists, they, they think that uh, an artist can illustrate my work, and, and that can work out very well. It can be an amazing work that comes out of that, of course. And the other way around, an artist, artists often think that uh, oh, I'm inspired by science, and then they, they make something uh, out of that, and that can also lead into fantastic, uh, interesting work. But sometimes maybe it can be a little bit on the surface of things, and I, I really like it when, when you can put things together and they are both really uh, rooted. Um. Another thing about my my process of working is that I get an idea and then I start to work and I'm very focused here but then and this can happen at any 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 moment then suddenly I get a lot of ideas and they go in very different directions and they might be uh, it, it might be very different techniques and themes and whatever and this thing 
because it can happen in the morning, it can happen when I'm not in my studio, it can happen while I work. And um, it's a bit chaotic. And I thought that, um, I thought, why am I like that? And, and I, sometimes I just had to lay down and sleep a little bit because I, I couldn't figure out how to, to deal with that energy that happened there. But then, while I was at the Art Academy, I found that if I s sat down in that situation and started to write about it and started to make sketches, then that, those moments would lead me into other sorts of work th that could uh, maybe even go together into a bigger project after a while. Uh, or uh, this could be a painting and this could be a sculpture. Uh, this could be a film, and then they're kind of making these kind of patterns, and and then you have more of those, right? And and then it goes on. And for an artist, it it, it works very well because then I can work at the same time a different project, and then the results. And of course, this is also going on. Uh, and sometimes I'm over there, and sometimes I'm there. And, uh, yeah. Because this process, of course, goes into every, <laughs> every one of those. So. So that's a little bit about the, the, the working process. Of course, I found out that that is not a bad thing when you're an artist at all. It's the opposite. It's a very, very, very enriching and, and good process. <laughs> so that's how it is sometimes. So uh, this article about dual thinking uh, is about two ways of, of, of thinking. It's, it's written uh, by Martin Schaeffer and some other scientists. I'm also a co-writer, actually. And um, it's about balancing your productive um, side, the, the, the time that you use in your office, maybe, writing articles, or, or for me, like really the, the, the process of doing the more um, the paperwork or, <laughs> you know, everything that has to be done uh, in addition to the creative works. And in science also you have this, you go from, you get an idea and you want to find the result. And often maybe you, you even know wh which result you want to find. Uh, and that's okay, but it's very important also to have this intuitive, free, uh, creative way of working at, because uh, innovation and new ideas can pop up there. So I, this, this was related also a little bit to ecology and biology, so that's why I, 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 I drew birds and uh, some graphs and some, some corals and, and fish and Darwin's little uh, early drawing up there, and yeah. So artists are often very much on the left side of the drawing, and we really need to to produce and to to focus, right? And then the uh, scientists are often, a lot of the time, many at least, on the the right side, and then it's about getting a good balance between those two ways of thinking. Okay. So, the human intelligence is in many ways based upon storytelling, I think. In a cinema movie, for example, we, we don't normally go directly into the big drama. There is usually a narrative where we learn to care about the characters before the big drama sets in. 
I think it works like that also when we want to communicate climate change and sustainable living as well. We need to make people care to show them that they are dependent of and that they are a part of nature itself. If we start by telling them frightening facts about ongoing or future disasters, they are more likely to turn away and focus on something else. Of course, it's important to inform about everything, but I think that real engagement often starts with a fantastic, interesting experience in nature or through art. And then you can present the facts. I think it is also important to dare to simplify complex science when you want to communicate it to a lot of people. You can write a book about a certain topic, but sometimes it is possible to communicate the essence in a sentence, a diagram, or a piece of art. This is the view out of our, our living room window just a few days ago, actually. <laughs> Yeah, these guys. So uh, that's Martin Sheffer to the right. And this is Karl Folken. This is from Uruguay for a little bit more than a year ago. They invited me twice to a conference and the workshop uh, in something called Sarah's Institute in Uruguay. Uh, and both times the theme was art and science. Um, and we also had time to work on some projects that we do together while we were there. And uh, while we were there, I was in a group together with Carl Folke, and the theme was icons in art and in science. And then <laughs> and then um, Carl drew a diagram on the board that they use at the uh, at the Bayer Institute, where he's a, a leader, and also at the Resilience Center in Sweden, where he's a scientific leader. Anyway, uh, this is representing nature, society, and economy. Um, okay. <laughs> so, what this is trying to, to capture is that the economy um, if the economy falls, then society still can stand. And if society falls apart, our society, then uh, nature is still standing. But if nature and the climate, as we know it today, and the, um, the ecosystems and the biodiversity, if that falls apart, then everything falls apart. And I think that uh, it has uh, also been looked upon as, as this, at least it was earlier, that you have uh, nature, society, and economy. And this is bigger, and that represents that if there is a problem that needs to be solved, and all these are uh, included in that problem, then economy will win, which is, yeah. And then uh, that um, there is another one as well where you have nature, nature, society, economy, and then they are. Uh, meeting in the middle, and the, in the middle there, there is sustainability. But I really liked that one. So uh, Carl turned around to us in the group 
And he said, uh, yeah, well, and he looked at me and, and I was crying. <laughs> Uh, like really, I had tears in my eyes, and he said, "Tumi, what is going on? Why are you crying?" And I said that I think it's just so amazing, so fantastic that you can say something so uh, complex, uh, and um, that that everyone can understand this, and uh, in such a simple way. And then he said, wow, that's fantastic. I've never seen anyone uh, react so emotionally to something as dry and boring as this. <laughs> um, but uh, I also understand that not everyone will be euphoric over a diagram like this. So I thought that maybe I could do an artwork about it. And this is a very new artwork. It's, I'm making it now. So I don't have the finished result, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. Um, and it's a sculpture. And so the upper part of the sculpture is made of a big sheet of, it's a, a piece of uh, plexiglass, and it's a small um, landscape made out of moss and lichens and everything is living, so it's plants and, yeah, and also rocks and soil on that surface. Uh, and that part, of, it, of course, is representing nature. And under that, you have uh, the next level in the sculpture, which is representing society, where you have a glass city in the middle um, with light inside, and then you have... Uh, um, agriculture landscape around it with with fields yeah and then underneath uh, it looks like a, a city at night okay I can th these are some very rough <laughs> the tests that I made just before I left actually uh, of the upper part and then of course it's a, a, a miniature landscape with, with uh, really a lot of details. And it's going to be exhibited in June. Uh, it's an exhibition about uh, uh, landscape protection areas in Norway. And it's uh, hanging in a, in a barn. So you can see it from, um, okay, from, uh, I'll just go back to this. You can see it from above and oh, like really from above. And you can also see it while you go down the stairs and you can see all the details when you go down and you can also see, see it from underneath. And, and from underneath the society part looks like a city at night. And I really like these patterns that also looks a little bit like almost like, uh, like uh, cells or brain cells or you have this kind of uh, so I, I, um, I draw into the glass, I scratch the city uh, lines into the glass, and then I put light through it from the sides. Um, and then all the lines light up. This is actually a, a, a city in China. I, I thought it was so beautiful. I, I don't know if I'm going to use that. Um, but I, and I don't dare to say the name in Chinese, I think. Han Jiu? Han Jiu? Is that it? <laughs> okay, okay. And then uh, the, the third part of the uh, sculpture is representing um, economy, economy. And it is made out of coins, international coins, in a bowl. And then there are also some coins that are sort of falling out, they hang from invisible strings underneath the sculpture itself. And of course, the thought behind my work here is that if you cut the lines to the, to the economy part, it falls down. If you cut the wires that holds the society up, it falls down. And if you cut the wires that hold the whole thing, that holds nature and everything up, then everything falls down. So it's a very it's a diagram that it gets very physical that way when you, when you see it as a three-dimensional sculpture. 
And then you can also see it from straight from underneath, like this. So it comes like towards you like this. It's very safe. I'm <laughs> making it very secure. Uh, and then, of course, it, it looks like the diagram again. Okay, so we are working on another project as well. And I can't say so much about it because, oh yeah, okay. because it, um, uh, it hasn't happened yet. But it's an international project called Reconnecting to the Biosphere, the Teleportation Project. And it's a project that I do together with Martin Schaeffer and Carl Folke. And the thought behind it is to make a connection between people in big cities and the nature close to that city. Because I think that real engagement starts uh, with, with, with uh, experiences in, in nature, for example. And um, yeah. So there is a, a sculpture in the city and a sculpture in, in, the, in nature close by, and they are connected. And uh, yeah, we'll see if it will, will happen. I'd like to talk much more about that, actually, and I will, I hope, <laughs> when it gets, uh, gets out. Um, I think that all living, all humans, but all human, all, all, um, all living things have a connection of some kind to nature. And I think it's so important to try to, to remind people of those values, because I think that's a very good s starting point when you want to try to make change. So that's it. Uh, yeah, I think, did I? It was a fine time wise. Okay, thank you very much. I'm so delighted to be here. <laughs> But I have like, I can show a very small thing, like five minutes before the discussion. It just takes five minutes. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm so happy that you came. And I'm, I'm thanks for, for the organizers, for, to Jan and, and Karen and, and the technicians and, and, and the, you and everyone. Um, I'll show just a very short talk between Martin uh, Schaeffer and, and me about uh, collaboration between art and science.
art and science is often looked upon as something very different that scientists look for the clear answer mm -hmm. and artists look for, for many answers uh, on many questions and it's so free and... Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I do believe that they can benefit a lot from each other. Yeah, and that they are, they are quite similar. Yeah, they are. I think the, in the process of making this movie we, we found out some of that. I, uh, I guess it, it, both arts and science have this process of exploration and very intuitive uh, uh, phase in which you're trying to see which thing you want to address. It's like an adventure, very associative, very, uh, and 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 you need that to find the interesting question or 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 the potential solution or something yes. and then you both have this phase of working on it right with the techniques that that you have with the techniques as a scientist that I have to do the equations the experiments so you both have the two phases but 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 the emphasis is somehow different right like in the arts the emphasis is very much on this creative intuitive process and in science sometimes people don't think it is there but it is important and yeah. maybe we should be more explicit about it and I think that working with the arts is, is very enriching for science be exactly because the artists are the are the specialists almost in this explorative process so working together I think is a, yeah. is a natural idea. Yeah artists are very used to looking at things from many different directions and twisting and turning and finding uh, many ways to look at the topic and for me as an artist it is very important to get a, a message out or just a feeling you know to communicate with with the people that actually uh, sees it and it's the same for science of course that you want to to um, people to hear the th about the things that you find out. <laughs> That's right. I want people yeah. to see the things I make and, and maybe get inspired uh, by that. Yeah, um, I think that's that's why it, in the first place we started to work together yes. because the first first thing I knew uh, is that I saw this movie that you made corals in a in a museum in in Sweden, and it it captivated me very much because it was this intriguing thing presented told so beautifully so the communication uh, as well as the topic of, of the change and movement resonated very much with what I do I'm interested in hmm. how things change or, or how they change suddenly or chaotically and then when you feel you get some essence of that how do you commu communicate it to the people Yes. So I saw just this coral movie of you, and I thought, oh, luckily, <laughs> something, something here yes. <laughs> that that is very much like I, what I want to. Uh, yeah. Okay, is there any questions? Hello. Hi, thank you. Lovely work. Um, just a, it's a technical question as one filmmaker to another. Um, when you're doing your um, the big project, the 30 minute project, how are the layers structured? How, obviously you don't have a, a tank which is 50 meters long and you're kind of dropping in all the time. And obviously it's upside down, isn't it? Yeah. So, so how, how do you layer it? Um, I uh, plan very well up front, uh, and I experiment. I, I use many different liquids, and I test it out and try it many times. Some some things uh, is transparent. Other liquids are really dense, and some fall very quickly, some slowly, and then it all goes on. Then I, I test it many times before it works, because in this film that is coming up now, then um, it takes uh, 10 minutes the whole, and I 
the, the whole, like each sequence, there's three sequences and they take 10 minutes more or less. And then you have to plan it very well, otherwise it would just be a gray. So, so gray it's one mark. tank. <laughs> Hmm? It's one tank. Yeah, and oh, it's so one this take. is one tank. One and tank. One take and, and one, one take. tank. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? There's a question there. Thank you. Your lovely, awesome work. Oh, um, thank you. That's very nice to hear. <laughs> um, so I have a friend back in Boston who wants to open a gallery, the point of which is to facilitate uh, collaborations between artists, scientists, and graphic designers. Yeah. And so. I'll come. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and, and I, I mean, I think for a lot of those people, that, that kind of collaboration feels funny, feels odd. How do we walk into that? And so, I mean, I think for the people here and for others who might see this, what wisdom would you share about starting the conversation and continuing the conversation? I mean, you said a little bit in the last video when the two of you were talking, but sort of practical wisdom for the house. How do artists and scientists start talking to each other? twice, I think, while I've been here. Do you really find this interesting? Of course I find it interesting. I mean, to listen to people and to also just to talk to people also outside the, 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 the presentations, but also to listen to presentations of people that really know their field and their topic um, is a huge inspiration. I mean, yeah. So, but how, how it's possible to, to start work? Well, I was lucky because these brilliant scientist, scientists, they saw my work and then they saw that maybe we had something in common and then they, I was contacted and then we started to work together. And it can work, of course, the other way around as well, that an artist uh, has a, a lot of respect for an, a scientist and, and then contacts the scientist maybe, for example. And, but uh, it's also very nice that people start up places like you do, where collaboration happens naturally like that. And also uh, in universities that you, you mix. I, I once I, I, um, looked at the word academy because I thought it was so strange. There were so many odd, uh, I don't know, like hair academy and nail academy, and like, <laughs> that they use that word. You wouldn't say like nail university, would you? Like, how, why they used that word in so many different ways. And then I locked it up, and the word uh, means an uh, institution, uh, education institution on a high level, on university level, for artists and scientists. That's the meaning of the word academy. That's what I read. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, so. But uh, yeah, I think that working together is such a natural idea. And also, like the, I don't know, if the, the perception seminar I talked about, then you, it's such an inspiration to, to hear other people's uh, point of view of, of life and, and what they do and, you know. And also children or, or elderly people, or you can learn from, from, from other people. That's, <laughs> it's, yeah. Okay, there's one question yeah. over. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I have a s somewhat similar question as uh, Eileen's, uh, except that I want to ask about um, the viewers. Um, and, and so, uh, because I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get to some of this myself uh, as to what kind of, what does real engagement mean? What does impact mean? And so, you, I think you mentioned that it goes into exhibits, it would probably go into you know, shows or, or, or discussions. Yeah. But um, in, 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 your, in your opinion, how do, you, how do you measure success, as it were? 
how do you measure that real engagement oh, yeah. with the people? So all this great stuff is created. Then who sees then what happens? Well, or who do you want to see and who, what do you want happen? I think that art is an international uh, language that we all share and that we, that we should share, <laughs> you know? And I, I think that, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, artwork, it's great to show an artwork in a, a museum, an uh, uh, art museum, or uh, other kind of museum, or an art gallery, but it's also fantastic, I think, to maybe show it as a projection on the wall in the uh, some shabby district in Rio, or, <laughs> or you know, like uh, other places, or, or in, uh, in the finance market, you know, like to other people that wouldn't necessarily see it in other ways, and also to uh, yeah, to, I think public art is a very good way of um, communicating. Yeah. And with your scientists, are you thinking about that that part of the strategy, which is the distribution strategy of your work, or are you just kind of at a point where he says, "Well, this sounds great. This looks great. We we we, we need to do something together, and let's just do something great." Yeah. And do, do you discuss with the scientists how you're going to get this out? Yeah, but it sort of develops naturally through that you make an artwork. I'm not, I'm, I'm a little bit shy, I think, as a person. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not the kind of artist that goes to a lot of events and, and <coughs> I like to, to, to just work and, and in my studio, and I like to meet people, and I like to have exhibitions. It's just that, uh, um, yeah. But um, in a way, it it happens gradually. Those kind of things, I think, for me, that I I get an idea, and then then we find out where we might want to show it, and then it it comes from from there, from the idea itself and then you can let it grow and, and if people think it is interesting then maybe a lot of people want to see it and then you know <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question very well but uh, yeah uh, there's a question over there yeah, I <clears throat> um, what, what you said in um, the beginning I found to be interesting in that um, you present your work and um, then someone looks at it and he reaches his own conclusions. Maybe in your mind, in your own mind, maybe you hope that he will reach a certain conclusion, like maybe he might uh, be more appreciative of uh, nature, like how crucial is our link to nature, hopefully. But you, you have no control over someone else's mind. No. So it's up to the person. What you can only, what can you, what, what you can do, is only to present your work, yeah. and whatever comes, well, that's not for you to be able to control, right? You may not be able to control that. That's one thing, and also uh, looking at the work that you have presented, I uh, get this uh, sense myself. So this is about my own reaction to your work. Okay. Uh, specifically, there was this uh, ego like uh, kind of creature. Uh, when I look at it, I, uh, uh, I've seen many eagle pictures before, including eagles, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, eagles, uh, yeah. Domest maybe <laughs> domesticated in a sense, in parts of Mongolia, for instance, where they have this tradition of keeping eagles for hunting, right? And also, of course, in the Middle East, right? And, but when I look at and I always admire you know, the way that they could do acrobatics, the way they could go after their prey, and uh, how they could, uh, the relationship between, uh, or the relationship between the eagles and their keepers, and the long tradition that us humans had, you know, keeping uh, eagles. When I look at your eagle though, it didn't give me the same feeling. It 
uh, gave me a feeling of uh, trouble. You know, my, my, my ego, <laughs> this particular ego is in trouble because I look at the head part, it kind of is a little bit messy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, I, and I really the, appreciate your comment. <laughs> it's not an eagle, it's a seagull. Uh, what, what was that? It's, a you know, seagull, right? Yeah, and there was so, a so thank, um, and uh, for, forgive me. Like, like that, that's why you don't see its head. Right, it right. Has a head. So you, you okay. see, you could only present your work, right, but to the audience, yeah, such as myself, yeah, right? Example, to me, it, it was an ego. <laughs> but I, I'm not a biologist, so for, forgive my no, ignorance. No, no. <laughs> okay, it's just a, a description of my uh, uh, reaction, okay? So, yeah, okay, yeah. fine. Seagull. So the seagull was in trouble. I mean, I like seagulls too, and terns as well. But maybe seagulls are in trouble. Maybe we are a little <laughs> bit. Are a li That's right. They're all a little bit in trouble. So it gave me that feeling. So and and when I look at your other uh, works, uh, some look like uh, you know our planet, but it was like half melted. So <laughs> it gave me the feeling of uh, foreboding. Maybe maybe that's the word for it. Yeah. Sense of trouble. It gets me a little bit worried. Yeah. So that's a feeling that I, I got. Yeah. And that's one thing. And the other thing is something else totally different uh, about uh, your collaboration uh, with uh, scientists. Um, see, when I look at your work, I thought this is something like maybe Avatar or something which was the work of uh, you know, computer scientists that it was all like done on the computer. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize that until yeah. our friend over there asked the question and you said, oh, you experimented with different uh, liquids and so forth. And I realized this was uh, not a dry bench, this was a uh, wet bench, you know, <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> liquids and stuff. <laughs> I didn't realize that, you know. And it took you a lot of time and patience and <laughs> experimentation. Yeah. 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 So I, I admire that. But then this brings up this question about collaboration with uh, scientists, between artists and scientists, but in a different way. Um, isn't it possible for you to collaborate with a computer scientist whom special effects, uh, he might be able to do this in minutes and show you how, right? I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I mean it this way, please don't misunderstand me. <laughs> please don't misunderstand me. You see, he has the technological know-how, but he may not have the creativity of what you have in mind. But instead of you uh, fiddling with, uh, you know, experimenting with uh, all kinds of liquids and, you know, taking so much time, right? Maybe he could uh, provide another avenue, yeah, you know, in, in yeah. collaboration in that sense. You yeah, know, yeah. is it yeah. possible? What, what I've been, yeah, thank you for that comment. Um, I really like, like real, you know, reality, <laughs> or um, sometimes people have said, what about your drawings? You can make it into like animations with like computer graphic, kind of. but I really like the human touch, you know, and I like the, to try to make something out of some, something that has some kind of universal laws that has to do with things that are underwater or out in space or in our bodies or that has this kind of um, this kind of language. And sometimes when you do computer graphics, it lacks some of that, I think. Uh, but I have been thinking about working with other fields, for example, uh, chemistry or physics or something that has to do more technically, maybe. I'm working actually now with uh, a video where I make crystals uh, grow into a beautiful landscape, right? And then it builds up, and these kind of systems that builds up, and, and maybe they, yeah. It's a, but it, it is, parts of it is a little bit dark. Some parts of my work is very light and optimistic, and some of, of the parts are very dark, and, 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 and that's how, how I am, and, 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 and yeah, it's good to express different feelings like that, okay. Actually, actually for my curiosity, how, how many know that it's water tank and ink? I also thought it was computer graphics as well. No, oh. 
<laughs> oh, okay, so I'm not that stupid. <laughs> okay, so the, the guy in red. Uh, can, can I just uh, like to fork? Uh, sorry, actually uh, he... Oh, okay, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think this will be quick. So, so firstly, a comment. So I'm a scientist okay, yeah. and <laughs> yes. um, my field is fluid dynamics and turbulence. So I have uh, <laughs> always felt okay. that I know uh, a sense in... I've always had a sense that turbulence is, is very beautiful and that's not widely appreciated. Uh, but now I think I've seen, uh, I didn't think it was beautiful like this. So thank you oh, very much. Thank you very much. Um, now more, so, so a question, sort of maybe slightly related to what we've had here is, in, to what extent do you feel that this kind of art is creating itself rather than you actually creating it? Because oh. you're working, you know, your tool here is something which is very alive. I mean, this is one yeah. of the most uncontrollable instabilities we, we know. Yeah. But you're creating with it, nevertheless. Yeah. Okay, so, and th that's one of the things that I think it, it is incredible when it comes to working with art, that you have the, the things that just happens by chance and the things that you plan very well. And I like very much to balance those two in my work a lot. So, because I love the things that just happens uh, by chance, uh, just as much as when I am I able, or feel able at least, to control my results, so my visual results, or yeah, it's so <laughs> it's very dark, yeah, but it is not that dark. <laughs> the film is actually on the internet, so you can all see it if you want to on my website. But yeah, I don't know. Did that answer? You know, sometimes with with these liquids, uh, also bad things happen that I totally didn't plan, and that doesn't look any good at all. And then I have to start from scratch, from scratch again. But then the opposite things happens all the time. Things that I didn't think about could happen while I'm working, and then that adds to the work. And if that's just a very smart that's a very, that, if that's just a very short um, piece of a, 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 a long film, then maybe I have to try to make that happen again, you know? So that, that's a part of the process of, of trying to capture those glimpses of, of uh, something interesting or something beautiful. Or, yeah, what, what just, was your... Just a technical question. Uh, just a quick technical there question. How yeah. many of your images are inverted? Are they all inverted? Uh, in this film, they are, yeah, yes. upside down. Yeah. Yeah. Took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay, and, and then probably the last question here. Yeah, yeah, I just wondered, you know, you've been working with scientists, Martin's been working with you. I, Martin isn't here to answer this, but I'm just wondering how much <coughs> has he informed your work yeah. and to what extent has that changed or yeah. evolved? Um, well, I've done all the visual. And, and he's done all the music, of course. And then it is inspired by his uh, science. Uh, because what I tried to do was to, to try to, to make a sort of a landscape. It's abstract, of course, and that it builds up and gets chaotic and then goes into uh, a, a phase where it's some, some um, early warning signals that it gets more darker and darker and quite dramatic. And then it goes into a tipping point where it gets very chaotic and then it tips over into a new system. And then it's more stable again in that system. So that's the... The inspiration. Yeah? Would you have done it, it without the collaboration? No. I wouldn't have ma made it like that, no. Okay, and the, so sorry, one, one final <laughs> quick question. So I, I don't know if I'm interpreting, interpreting you correctly, but... I had a few comments, and um, the way I s heard what you said is that um, what you're interested in is the process. And of course, what you're doing here can be done with special effects, with a mobile phone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the process of working with the materials, the tactile, the touch, and it's that process where your ideas come about. And uh, perhaps that process isn't the same when you're, you, we are, you're sitting in front of a computer and looking at this screen, and that creative process that you 
are involved with doesn't happen that way, and that would be perhaps why you don't use special effects to do what you're, you're doing, and maybe that um, could clear that up for some of the computer scientists that are sitting here and saying, well, why go through all that trouble? Well, you, <laughs> yeah. As I said before, I, I love the computer graphics. It's a, it's a wonderful tool. And I, maybe I, if anyone wants to collaborate, <laughs> I, could, I could try it out, you know. But what, what I'm interested in also, when you saw a little bit of my uh, paintings, is the material itself, like the physicality, or what you call it in English, mm -hmm. of it. That, for example, sometimes I paint with a, with a red-orange color, and then when light shines through it, it gets pink. It changes color when light comes. So, so that means that the, the, if you hang up that painting and it's painted on glass, then light shines through it and it actually changes color. I like these magical things that happens with the materials themselves. Uh, yeah. So that's an important part of the process. Definitely, mm -hmm. yeah. I could say much more about that. <laughs> But you know, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, can we put our hands together to thank Tony uh, again? And as uh, usual, on behalf of the organizers, there's a little token for you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you.